and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Senior Minister for Education, Razi Judin, has announced that the Form 3 Assessment Examination, or PT3, will be abolished effective this year. This after two years of the PT3 exams being cancelled due to the pandemic. And last year, the Standard 6 UPSR, uh, UPSR examinations was also abolished. Now, earlier this week, the, exam the Education Minister was asked by Parliament to attend a special select committee uh, to provide further explanation as to the rationale to do away with the examination, as well as some of the preparations and alternatives in its place. However, the minister had failed to turn up for that meeting. Joining us on the show tonight to um, provide us some clarity as, uh, to, on this move, we have Chan Sun Singh. He is the CEO of Teach for Malaysia. Sun Singh, um, we know you can't speak on behalf of the Education Ministry, but as a stakeholder in the education system, can you share with us what you do understand to be the reason to do away with the PT3 exam, exam and to replace it with um, school-based assessment? What do you understand to be the reason why? Yeah, hi, Melissa and Sherrod. Thank you so much for having me. You know, the, this has been actually part of a very, very long um, uh, shift away that the ministry has has started implementing um, since uh, in primary school since uh, over ten years ago I think two thousand and it started in two thousand and twelve uh, in secondary schools to shift towards a uh, a school based assessment uh, system so you know I think at, at Teach from Malaysia we we support the move and we think that it's a shift in the right direction but as with all policy implementation you know the devil is in the implementation of it. And the real challenge will be um, how we support teachers as well as school leaders and, and the, the district and state officers to really be able to make this shift uh, in a meaningful way. So the a challenge with our education system is that, you know, we're, we're, we're very, very focused on uh, our exam results. And a problem with that is that our exam results are not necessarily um, a strong proxy for or a strong indica uh, indicator of learning quality. Uh, in Malaysia, we see that our SPM, uh, end of high school results, always continuously, we have more kids scoring straight A's every year. Um, but that, that trajectory is not in line with our international assessments. So with our PISA outcomes, we are not um, increasing or growing as quickly in terms of our outcomes uh, as we are in terms of our national outcomes. So it's not necessarily an indicator of uh, strong quality. So um, this shift away from, from the exam orientation, we think is a good thing. Okay, so I'm saying, I, I know a lot of um, there's a lot of criticism about exams, uh, you know, that it uh, it narrows the focus of uh, education and so on and so forth. But exams do have a purpose. And I'm wondering if uh, we're going to be throwing out the baby with the bathwater in this instance uh, at, because we might, uh, the system as it were, is, might not be prepared for the, the, the greater burden that uh, the school-based assessment places on teachers um, and, you know, which suggests that they have the, you know, for instance, the capacity to make these assessments and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right, Sherrod, in that exams do serve a function and they do help to measure some things really well. So, for example, memory recall, right, like the lower order kind of thinking, can you memorize facts? Do you understand um, certain basic concepts? Exams can measure that. And to an ex and exams also, um, you know, I think have typically really, really been valued by um, society because they give you kind of a benchmark, right, of um, where students are at, their performance, and comparatively to war against one another, as well as school by school and district by district, state by state, right? So a, a question that, that we're asking ourselves is, it, without exams, how, how, um, you, oh, how do we do that, right? How do we measure? How do we know if um, our kids 
uh, are doing well uh, enough and comparatively across the board, how do they stack up against other kids in schools versus schools, right? Um, I think that, you know, like, like I said earlier, the, the ministry has been shifting towards this uh, school-based assessment system um, for, for 10 years uh, now in secondary schools and over 10 years in primary schools. So there, there is an alternative that has been in place. So it's not something that's going to come as a shock uh, to the system. But the reality is that across these 10 years, um, the examinations, the high stakes examinations, so the SPM, PT3 and UPSR has still taken precedence uh, over the school-based assessments. And with the abolishment of um, the, the PT3 and the UBSR, uh, the hope is that, that the teaching profession will now shift towards focusing um, really meaningfully on, uh, on the school-based assessments. Right. So, Sun Seng, you said there's been 10 years of the school-based assessment. I, I understand it's classroom assessment. There's also the physical sports and extracurricular uh, assessment as well as psychometric assessments. Uh, the last 10 years, has that, been, has that school based assessment been effective? Has it been effective in measuring a student's progress and their, um, perhaps their academic inclin inclinations? Yeah, you know, I think that actually hearing from students themselves, right? Um, I, I spoke to a couple of students recently about this, and what, what their takeaway is that the school based self assessments have actually really helped them to understand um, their learning on an ongoing basis, right? And so I think that there's something actually quite powerful about it. But the reality is, like I said, um, the focus because of the these really, really high stakes um, national centralized examinations, um, the focus has really always maintained um, to be just focusing on the exam orientation, right? And so then what happens is that the school-based assessments have really kind of been this secondary, um, somewhat sidelined thing that you kind of just have to do as a part of uh, a part of the job, but not at the core of, uh, of, of what is informing the instruction and the learning in classrooms. And so with that shift, hopefully that will, uh, will then place the priority on these school-based assessments. Um, but they, 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 haven't, they haven't definitely um, realized their potential yet in the system. And something you point to a very interesting anomaly, right? You say that every year we're getting more kids passing with higher grades or with, you know, the more uh, kids scoring in the upper percentile, whereas this is not uh, reflected in the PISA scores, which is an assessment based um, and run outside of Malaysia. Is there, you know, a deeply, and this is the cynic in me speaking, a deeply politicized dimension to exams and exam results in Malaysia that that will militate against, uh, you know, uh, honest assessment of our young kids and their skills, um, and that, that this might not go away just because you move from exams to school-based assessment. In fact, it might exacerbate the problem. Yeah, and so you know, I think that maybe maybe as an example that might be helpful. What we can we can look to actually is is what Indonesia is doing with their examination system. So what Indonesia has done is that they've actually done away with all national examinations and has have shifted totally to a school based uh, examination system. They don't even have. Uh, an SPM equivalent. So they don't have an end of secondary school equivalent and they're relying on university entrance exams to help students make that transition, right? So what they've then done instead is actually they are then going to do um, uh, tests, um, not, not a national test, but basically similar to the way that PISA is run. So PISA is an international uh, program for assessment, um, but not every kid in the country in Malaysia sits for the PISA test. And what it's done is it's based on certain, um, on a randomized sampling of students from all the countries that participate to, to get the outcomes, right? And so what Indonesia is then going to do is that they've then developed um, PISA-like uh, assessments, which they will then randomly sample uh, across the country in order to understand uh, understand their benchmark, right? So I think that the first thing, you know, Shard, I, I don't know, uh, your, you know, your assumptions may, may, may be true, but I think more, more than um, from my opinion or from my perspective, I think it's really about tying or, or, or tying tying the quality of our assessment um, to, uh, to an international standard. 
um, because I think that the challenge, uh, the challenge with having uh, a local standard, which is important to have a local standard, but to ensure that that local standard stacks up, right, stacks up against international right. standards, and tying that quality, I think, is uh, is something that will be important to do. In the last couple of minutes that we have left, I understand that you know there is this school based assessment that is going to perhaps replace PT3, and we are going, maybe moving in the direction of doing away with high stakes examinations, who knows? Uh, can I ask you, Sun in the short term, what is it that you'd you like to see in this, at the start of the conversation, you mentioned the need to support teachers, you need to support school leaders and uh, the state and district uh, education officers as well. What uh, uh, moves can the um, ministry do or give or provide for um, to make sure that there is an actual um, replacement for the PT3? Yeah, uh, I, I think that's that's the that's the key question, right, Melissa? Um, I, I think that in a system where um, for decades, right, the only or the key sort of form in which uh, your 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 performance has been measured is through a singular source of truth, which is these national examinations. It, it is going to take a while for that shift uh, for that shift to happen, right? And I think that the understanding of uh, you know the ministry has uh, almost four hundred and twenty thousand teachers, and to to shift that mindset across four hundred and twenty thousand people, uh, I think is a massive task, right? And so I think that. Um, the 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 big thing that will need to happen in order uh, to make this work is really to shift pressure away from teachers to um, to show results uh, in a certain type of way or in a very sort of narrow way. So actually, as part of the the move away from PT three, what's going to happen is instead of a PT three at the end of three years of secondary school, there will still be a summative end of year examination at the end of every. Uh, school, uh, every year. So form one, form two, form three, but not a cumulative one at the end of uh, form three. And the risk is if that end of year summative assessment becomes the most prized thing that uh, that teachers and students' performance is measured on, then that will that will that will, everything will just go to waste, right? So for an, an example of how that can potentially be um, uh, be abated is if you weight it, right? So uh, for all, you know, everyone that's done university assessments, you do, you know, a certain percentage goes to your final exam, a certain percentage goes to projects. And so if you can weight that, right, like you have your end of year examination, but if that accounts just for 30% of your overall score, and then the rest of your formative uh, school-based or classroom-based assessments uh, then account for the rest of your academic score, um, then that could help to do that. And so that could be a, a quick win to, to help support with that. But the key thing is really shifting um, mindsets of school leadership and district leadership to ensure that teachers aren't pressured uh, to, to showcase um, very narrow results with their examinations. Sun Singh, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. Chan Sun Singh, CEO of Teach for Malaysia. We're going to take a quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. Hi, thanks so much for staying with Shrad and I on Consider This. Tonight we're discussing the move to abolish the Form 3 Assessment Examination of PT3 and what is the plan going forward. Joining us now is Datuk Satina Said Saleh. She's the President of the Malaysian Association for Education. She's also a member of the National Education Advisory Council for the 2018-2020 to 2020 session. Uh, the National Education Advisory Council is an independent body that was set up in 2010 to provide an advisory role to the Ministry of Education. Dr. Satina, can I ask you what your, um, your reaction has been to this announcement of doing away with PT3 and um, having school-based assessment be its replacement? Well, I have actually spoken once or twice uh, to a couple of people. In fact, I, a few conferences or seminars uh, my take is this, um, I don't have any objection totally 
uh, in abolishing or do away with PT3. But it just that how it was done, that was my, my biggest concern. You know, uh, when the ministry, uh, when they, they did an announcement, you know, to, to abolish this PT3, I think people were kind of uh, in the limbo. People were not aware. Actually, one or two weeks uh, before that, a few people asked me whether that uh, what is happening to PT3? I said, I have no idea. So it was a shock to me as well because um, I just feel that they could have prepared, you know, uh, the stakeholders, other stakeholders, including teachers, students, parents, and uh, people like us, you know, that this is going to be abolished. But uh, regretfully, uh, it was not done. Um, I am the president of Malaysian Association for Education Melissa, and we were we were not aware about it actually. Uh, I wish um, sort of engagement uh, uh, were conducted prior to the announcement. You know, to the announcement. I, I'm not totally against it because I do like school-based assessment, but the way it is done in a hurry like this, it may have a lot of repercussion. Uh, you know. Um, uh, issues uh, right can we talk about mm, can we talk about the repercussions because many of us don't quite understand how schools operate uh, you know mm -hmm. and how important the you know the calendar for the school is uh, and how it will change as a result of a remove an exam for instance do, do you know what what will actually in, in a material sense change about the school calendar uh, and in the ways that teachers teach as a result of this decision right one thing i can answer you i will not be able to tell you about the school calendar but as far as i think it is, uh, uh, you know i think there should not be any changes the, if there's going to be any change it will be only the number of periods number of hours allocated for one period one subject they may have to extend it make it a little bit more flexible so that they'll be able to do a little bit little bit of assessment but before that uh, sharon and melissa I just feel that um, what I think ought to be done because PT3 uh, definitely uh, an exam that is not going to evaluate students, you know, to to the extent where we can actually really produce 21st century learning type of students because that is like a short term, you know, I, and uh, you know there are two things we need to actually understand between assessment and evaluation. So these are the two um, interchangeable uh, words, uh, important uh, aspect that was not being explained prior to this, um, uh, what we call this abolishment of uh, PT3. Uh, many people will always think that assessment is the same with evaluation. No, they are not the same. So uh, I had a couple of, uh, I had a chit chat with my members because we want to know some of them are experts in these areas, you know, uh, what could happen. Uh, Sharon, I couldn't answer your question because you know why? I, I won't know what is going to happen because right. they, have not, they have not told us anything at all. Well, well, then may I follow up on that then? You know, you said you wished that the uh, ministry had done more engagement before making this, this sudden announcement. What would you like them to have explained, particularly in doing away with, as you said, the, uh, the evaluation and now we're moving towards school-based assessment? Right, yeah. I think this, um, these two uh, terminologies, they are, they are inter interconnected, interrelated. But I think most importantly, parents or students or teachers, when you are being given something new, or not totally new, but something that you need to work towards it, the teacher will have to be totally prepared if they want to do school-based assessment. So when you don't understand why, they, why am I doing it? Uh, I, what I can't understand, Melissa and uh, Sharad, you have many divisions in the Ministry of Education. Lembaga Peperiksaan, for example, EPRD, for example, Planning and Research, and uh, uh, Curriculum, for example. These are the people, they have experts in explaining about all this. You have to tell them. You can't tell them, please do and change this, but we do not know why am I doing this. So I think that type of syndication, that type of explanation, were not done at all. The people, the parents were fumble. Why? Students were saying that I've been studying. Why am I not sitting for an exam? Uh, to me, those are the few aspects that should have been done prior to this announcement uh, by the Ministry of Education. Right. Yeah. What we understand is that 
well, we hope that policymakers have an objective, right? So the improvement of uh, studying outcomes, uh, you know, building a holistic child so that they 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 can, they, they have the the flexibility and they're nimble in terms of the kinds of challenges that are going to come up in the 21st century. So we, there are all kinds of objectives. When you look at a decision like this, what yes. do you think? What was the underlying objective? And will it actually be uh, uh, served by a decision like this? Um, I can say one thing. Uh, dissatisfaction is definitely there. And students, uh, teachers and students will be interrupted in their process of learning, teaching and learning. And effectiveness in learning and teaching will be definitely affected by this. Because when you don't understand, actually, as I mentioned just now, I, think, I don't think I have time to explain in here. When, we, when they are not able to explain what assessment is all about between PT3 and between school-based assessment, as well as evaluation, so parents will not understand. Some of them in the university, they will understand. So I, what will happen? Uh, they will be upset. They will be, we are not going to focus on just academic achievement anymore. We are going to focus in the whole sum of uh, a child, you know, at the end of their learning, six years or 13 years. But PT3 actually is after nine years. So um, I think, I think uh, in my opinion, it is not something that is uh, bad now. It can be rectified. I, I feel it can be rectified by the ministry. Rectified in what way, Dr. Satina? Uh, I think they, what they can do now, they have to start moving, start doing this explanation to them. Open up to the parents, open up to the stakeholders, talk to us, call us. Engagement has not been done. I, I am a little bit surprised when I was um, the uh, you know in the council member with the Nas national education advisory council we had many engagement when they had a little bit of issues even prior to that when i was still in the ministry we have to call people before we make any policy decision because you can't make this decision on your own uh, can, can can i ask you um did this you, you mentioned that this you you know just a few weeks ago somebody had asked you what was happening with pt3 i take it this decision came as a surprise to you do you feel the timing was wrong, that like this is not the right time? And if it's not the right time, then when would be the right time? Absolutely. I would say you, you don't, in my opinion, uh, I think many years I've been involved in policy uh, formulation, policy announcement by the ministers and the, by the DG. You need to give them time to digest, to embrace what actually that you want to do. But this is not being done. You know, you're kind of just throw it, you take it or you leave it, that's all. So it is not fair to, to stakeholders. I'm just using the word stakeholders because all of them are stakeholders. So I think what they should have done, give them time. At least minimum is until end of this year. You want to start it next year, but you have to work so hard in explaining. I can't understand why is Lembaga Perpreksa, and that is the most important in this area, they are not coming out. Probably they have been told not to do it. I don't know. Uh, with this type of explanation, you know, I know some of them, my former colleagues, they are experts in telling them when when you don't talk about what you want to do you know just like teaching before you start teaching you have to tell your student what am i going to ad achieve at the end of this lesson so uh, this is not being done unfortunately unfortunately i want to ask you about the what do you think is the impact of you know political instability in our country has on the education system. We've had uh, changes in leadership at the ministerial level because we've had new governments, new mi prime ministers, and education is always seen as a very important portfolio. Um, but sometimes uh, to just brand, you know, the, um, uh, the, the career of the politician rather than in, in terms of, uh, you know, helping kids. So I, I'm wondering, do you think that our education system has been um, undermined by political instability? The answer, yes. To me, uh, what happened actually, education is something that you can't sacrifice. You can't, you cannot climb up the ladder of being a politician, good politician by actually sacrificing or by actually putting education aside. You can't. Education is the core thing that actually is going to determine what is going to happen in our country, the type of human being, human resources. But as it is, I can see now, education, I said it before, Melissa, is being politicized too much. But I think being politicized, if the policy is still being implemented the way it should have been done, you know, 
then it is a different story. But don't get all mixed up. Sadly, uh, people like me, we, we, are, we are the last Mohicans. I always use the word, you know, that last Mohicans in the education system. Uh, we feel so sad because uh, personally, I, I, the minister can be angry with me. It's okay. I don't see anything moving. Things are like really on standstill. Educa uh, Malaysian Education Blueprint, I was involved in it. You know, it was done by Tanshri Mohidin. It, was an, it is an amazing piece of work. It's been copied by many other countries. But you are not focusing on how to actually deliver this, the best way to deliver it to teachers and students. Right. Again, information is not actually, uh, it's not gone down actually. It is diluted halfway. Thank you for joining us on the show tonight. We appreciate your time. That was Datuk Satina Said Saleh from the Malaysian Educa Association for Education. And that wraps up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutun, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.